hello everybody. Welcome to our first uh, the Web Science Institute Distinguished Lecture for this uh, academic year. Um, we did have a lovely lecture set of books somewhere else on campus, but we got bumped because of increasing student numbers. And um, so we couldn't do the tea coffee thing, so thank you all for coming. And the people will come in. This is a lecture theatre where everyone has to stand up to let you know. Anyway, well, well, I'm sure you'll make it work. Um, before uh, I have to do the safety announcements, like the toilets are out there, there's no fire alarm planned, there's a fire door there, and if a bell goes off, everybody go for the exit. I'll be the slowest because I've got my walking stick, so you'll all be out before me anyway. Um, uh, right, so it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Phil Howard to you today. Um, Phil is the director, I should give him his titles, but he's the director of the uh, Oxford Internet Institute, which uh, is an old friend of uh, us at the WSI. We work very closely with them, have done over the years, have many joint projects. And Phil is the latest incumbent as the director took over from Helen Margetts a year ago, 18 months ago, yeah. Um, and uh, his uh, speciality as, uh, is uh, politics and uh, the, the social uh, networks around that and how that impacts um, the, the two working together. He is a Canadian, so anyone who calls him American will get <laughs> He's from Canada. Um, and uh, you can see, I mean, I've got his CV here and you can all read it online. And he is an incredibly accomplished uh, academic, many publications in this area, uh, political scientist to start with economics and then a PhD in sociology at Northwestern before he set out on his academic career. And he's had many awards, uh, has been featured in the New York Times and the Washington Post and won the 2018 Democracy Prize, uh, which named you a global thinker uh, for pioneering uh, the social science of fake news production, which is something a lot of us have got interested in today and um, at the moment. So uh, I've only met Phil, we've been trying to, we knew we had the new director at the Oxford Internet Institute and everybody on the team was saying, well, you must meet, you must go and meet Phil, Wendy, you must go and meet Phil so that we can keep this uh, association going between the two institutes. And uh, we found out we had a friend in common, uh, Professor Noshir Contractor at uh, Northwestern. Um, he wasn't your supervisor, was he, or anything like that, but you, so Noshir, who is a, a great friend of ours and on the Websites Trust Board, set us up with a sort of blind, academic blind date, yeah? yeah. And, <laughs> and this, we actually ended up meeting in at the most strange conference ever in Dubai, yeah? And it was just, I, I won't, it was just a very, very weird conference about AI in Dubai with a very weird, but, but actually, we found out, just as Noshir said we would, that we got on like a house on fire. And I asked Phil then if he'd come and give this distinguished lecture, and he said unhesitatingly yes. So uh, thanks to Noshir, really, but also to our ongoing friendship with the, the Oxford Institute, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Phil, who's going to talk to us about tomorrow's Levethian machine learning in a political world. Phil, over to you. Welcome everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to show off some of our research and um, get everybody depressed about the prospects of democracy. And then the, the narrative arc will, will uplift us, take us forward to the ways in which uh, we as researchers can save democracy um, through our study of public life and perhaps um, through the application of sophisticated machine learning algorithms to some of the big problems that, that we face in the years ahead. So my talk is called Tomorrow's Leviathan, Machine Learning in a Political World. May I ask how many of you uh, suffered through some kind of politics 100 or theory 101 or political theory, introductions to political theory, and might know roughly what this might be about? Wonderful, okay. I will be using a little bit of uh, Hobbes in my talk, and I'll um, do my best to provide the context and uh, definitions, and I'm happy dur during Q&A to talk a little bit more about the, the th theories that I would like to use to help us anticipate 
what AI might do to our public life. It's very important for me as a social scientist, I don't do prediction. I, I try to say things that are prescient, but it's very important to stay close to the evidence that we have at hand when, when, when being prescient. So I don't see this as an exercise in futurism. Uh, I don't see this as an exercise in um, codifying science fiction or imagining the, the worst possible outcomes for public life. I'll say a little bit about the OII and what we're up to. I'm going to talk about the research, the things we already know about automation in political life. I'm going to talk about some of the scenarios in which AI will be applied to pushing public opinion uh, or shaping, framing political conversations. And then I'll refer a little bit on the strategies that we could use to help uh, prevent the worst of the possibilities. Now the Oxford Internet Institute is an unusual department in that it's about a third humanists and a third computer scientists and a third social scientists. And our computer scientists have to do the course in political theory, or at least understand enough to be literate, uh, to be able to talk with the rest of us in the social sciences. Our social scientists have to at least appreciate the craft of code, if not be able to code on their own, uh, to build things as they do their research. And our humanists are valuable because they, it's often the humanists that give us the, the toughest questions to answer, or, or do the best work at framing what the important questions are um, to work on public life. So uh, Helen Margetz, who is um, director for several years, Luciano Floridi, you may have seen uh, his roadshow, uh, one of the important scholars in, in ethics and AI. Victor Mayer Schoenberger uh, basically coined, made the business case for big data. He wrote the book Big Data. He, he's the reason policymakers think of big data as a, as a term. Um, and I have other colleagues working on health, um, uh, counterfactuals, ways of figuring out how to ensure that AI is uh, useful us in public life and accountable. The research I'm going to present today has been benefited in large part from an ERC Consolidator Award. That's the, the, the bulk of the funding behind the basic science. As you, many of you will know, uh, public science agencies uh, will advance the science but don't contribute to the engagement, the public engagement work. Uh, other funders, for us it's um, ADESIM and Open Science, uh, the Open Society Foundation, they're less interested in supporting the science, but they will support the public engagement work. So these are the, these are the three organizations that um, are, are, are primary benefactors at the moment. In, in early 2017, I wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post arguing that Facebook would know more than we would ever know on the outside about Russian involvement in either the Brexit conversation here or the uh, 2016 election. And I argued that it was time for Zuckerberg to testify. And this cracked open a conversation about having Zuckerberg testify on Congress, into Congress. He came that summer, the summer of 2017. And when he presented, um, he defended the firm, but he handed over to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence a data set of a little more than 3,000 known Russian accounts. These were accounts that uh, had clearly been started from St. Petersburg and were, were managed and were um, very actively. The firm uh, did the attribution, said these uh, were the Russian managed accounts. The um, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence decided that US universities had been largely captured by Silicon Valley and did not want, and they did not themselves employ any data scientists, so they turned to our team to help analyze the data. This is actually a good message for those of you working on social data science in some respect, because I think most governments around the world, most policy agencies around the world, I don't know they need to have a data scientist on hand to help understand contemporary problems. So the work I'm going to speak of, the evidence, comes from our analysis of these uh, 3,000 Russian accounts. And to help frame the problem of automation and the role of public life, I want to take us back to Hobbes' Leviathan. Now, Hobbes is important for those of us working in political theory for several reasons. Um, perhaps one of the most important is that he had the first major text written in English. And this is one of the reasons the manuscript disseminated as far as it did. But an important part of Hobbes' argument, what makes it sort of compelling, intuitively compelling to us, is that society and our governance institutions are ultimately composed by us. It's, it's our values that construct a legitimate authority, a legitimate sovereign that governs. 
Now, this image is from the, the front piece of the, um, the manuscript as originally published. And one of the important reasons this, this is such a compelling image, one of the most memorable images in political theory, is that within the massive shirt piece of the Leviathan, the sovereign that rules us all, are the individual figures that all together add up to a legitimate authority for governing us. Now, I'm going to go through several definitions. Um, these are the core components of, of Hobbes's Leviathan metaphor. On our own, in our state of nature, life is miserable. Um, our quality of life is poor. Our, in fact, we're not likely to live long. Uh, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. We agree to participate in a society. We agree to uh, surrender rights to a sovereign in the hope that that sovereign, or with the agreement, the understanding that the sovereign will protect us and raise our quality of life. Fearing violent death, we seek peace. To create commonwealth, we give up rights. I would argue that the primary right we're currently ceding is a right to privacy, but we can unpack that. The point, as far as Hobbes is concerned, is that we, we have, as individual citizens, to give up some rights to the sovereign. It's one of the sacrifices we must make to be part of a society. The other thing I, one thing I won't unpack, Hobbes had a preference for monarchy over democracy or anything else. I'm not going to touch that one in this, um, this particular talk. There are also many definitions of what politics is. And um, my favorite from my undergrad tutor is simply this. Politics occurs when one person tries to represent another person. This um, was well distilled by George W. Bush, who said that politics is when we choose the choosers. And the idea of democracy in this frame is that we elect people who we hope will go ahead and not bother us for four or five years while they make the different decision of political life. And that process of making a choice, electing somebody, who sits in office, becomes part of the sovereign power. Um, we set those people to be up um, on their own and work independently. Now, I think we sort of assume that once we put them in office, they'll work with evidence in their decision making. And um, that may not be a safe assumption now. So this is my founding um, definition of what politics is. What, which, what happens when one of us tries to represent the rest of AIs, there's also multiple definitions of what AI is. Uh, I, um, I define them as collections of algorithms and data that simulate learning, reasoning, and classification. And you'll see shortly why that particular definition is rhetorically useful to me. <coughs> Let me go into the evidence now. Um, our basic analysis of what these three 3,200 known Russian accounts were up to in the 2016 election. Um, if you're on social media, this is probably the, the basics of social media for most of you. If you're on social media, you have bots following you, especially if you're a Twitter user. This is an example of one of the accounts we, tr we scooped up at some point. Um, they have crazy numbers of followers, right, or unrealistic numbers of uh, amounts of content production, or unusual uh, ratios of content production, likes to dislikes or uh, followers to um, uh, following. In this case, the bear might give it away. Um, this is one of the Russian accounts that we tracked. Sometimes the accounts will occasionally tweet in Cyrillic and then going back, go back to working in English. And so there's, there's a variety of techniques we use as an outsider to, to capture, scoop um, accounts we believed are managed by foreign governments. When we start a fresh scoop of bots, we tend to work with Trump's follower list. I don't mean that as a political jab, that is a methodology point. Um, he has such a large number of um, bots following him. These are accounts with the uh, numbers, right, instead of names, or accounts with no pictures at all, uh, that never generate any content. That's, that's our starting point for scooping data. And the problem isn't so much the existence of these, uh, these bots, right? it's not the automation itself that is a problem, it's the, the bonds become a problem when they circulate the nastiest of sexist or racist content. This is one of the examples of a story from um, Russia Today of um, Muslim women storming the beach and ruining your holiday or uh, breaking through passport control in Morocco and uh, uh, racing into Spain. Uh, two images turn out to be doctored later. 
the, the point is that, that the code itself is not politically problematic. It's that actors use it to distribute large amounts <coughs> of junk news, information that's purposefully, ideologically driven um, to mislead. Now, um, our work was started, launched with 2016 in the US and Brexit. And since then, we've done another 40 country studies, different kinds of elections, different periods of time. Um, we've done WhatsApp and YouTube. Uh, we're trying to do Telegram. Um, there's a lot of activity in Instagram we wish we would know uh, more about. We have Tinder at one point. In the 2017 election in this country, there was a bot that would flirt and then talk about Jeremy Corbyn. And the only reason we know about it is because the, the campaign managers who designed the bot went on Twitter and thanked the bot for giving them the edge in two or three districts where they thought their engagement over Twitter had just pushed them, pushed them, pushed their candidates to win. So it's an amusing example, but the campaign managers think there's a causal connection between spending time on this kind of campaign material and uh, winning office. There's a number of seats up front. You're welcome to come down at any time uh, and have a seat up front. <coughs> now, in this kind of study, when you're trying to understand the uh, impact of technology on public life, um, it's very important to be multi method And I think this is one of the valuable things of a discipline that we often call science and technology study. The analytical advantage of SPS is that it relaxes, I think, it relaxes the assumptions that the only way to tell a causal story is with a human agent. Often in an SPS perspective, you can attribute causality to the material world, to the technological affordances that we have in our lives. And perhaps even more better way of saying this is that it no longer makes sense to tell a causal story in modern politics without giving some causal attribution to both and the social order at the same time. Now, in order to capture that stuff, you need the large scoops of data that come out of a quantitative side of the story. And then you need the qualitative work, because that qualitative work is often the work that brings home the punchline, that helps you interpret the big data. So for example, um, one of my colleagues has returned from, uh, one of my colleagues has returned from field work in Poland where he studied a um, firm that rents out tens of thousands of fake Facebook users. What industry, uh, they maintain a, a legend of 40,000 fake Facebook users, what industry do you think would pay to rent tens of thousands of fake Facebook users at a time? Their primary clients are not politicians. What industry would pay, would pay to rent? Sorry? Advertising, yeah. Well, what kind of advertising industry? What kind of industry would want would, would do that? Beauty. A good guess. Um, many of the best bots were designed for the Kardashians, right? They're designed to promote that uh, goods, um, beauty products. Uh, no, one more. Oil and gas. Oil and gas. Another good guess. They uh, spend aggressively on these kinds of things. No, it's pharmaceuticals. Uh, so they'll rent ten thousand people to have troubles managing their migraines and then 10,000 more people to uh, have a new medicine for managing their migraines. And they have the interaction in public, and that, that's what counts as um, advertising for the industry. So doing field work with the businesses that do this stuff is very important for understanding it, for helping to interpret what the big data reveals when we play with the large scoops. So being qualitative with our interviews and field work, being comparative and then computational um, helps tell, uh, give a sense of the full picture. Now I'm going to go through um, the three perhaps most important charts from our report to the Senate on what we, we found the Russians doing. The, this, these, you'll recognize these as descriptive statistics. They're not, um, there wasn't any fancy modeling here. But they do tell the story about the role of um, the Russian accounts in the US 2016 election. The first thing we did was to break out Facebook activity and Instagram. We got Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube data. Google provided search data, but they provided it in PDF form. And we don't know why. Um, it doesn't naturally occur in that form, and they must have realized the Senate was not going to print, uh, was not going to print the, the, the data. Anyway, so we have not analyzed the, the PDF form data from Google search. And this is just uh, account activity. 
Now, um, the first point of this figure is that Russian activity uh, blooms, bursts to life, on the natural days in the political calendar where there's things going on in politics. So, um, uh, Trump wins the nomination, the Russian burst of Russian activity. Um, Trump and Clinton do their three debates, bursts of Russian activity, the sexist stuff going after Hillary Clinton. Uh, the day of the election, burst of Russian activity. After the election, uh, much of this is automated activity, but after the election, you can tell that they go to sleep, they rest. Right? There's a, a moment where um, there's a dip in activity. The interesting part of this figure for us um, is that the bulk of Russian activity um, in the data set provided by Zuckerberg occurs after the election. It's, it's not activity before the election. It's since 2016, the data goes up. This was the end, this is the reason for the end point in the data. Um, it's almost as if after 2016, they decided that there was something successful in what they were doing. And they either doubled down with more personnel resources or more money. But the volume of content great, grows greatly after the election. And in fact, um, we have plenty of reasons to believe it hasn't, um, hasn't stopped. The other surprise for us, uh, being able to identify a few accounts, let us identify others um, and uh, pick out their creation dates. Some of the test accounts that we were able to uh, identify that the Russians managed started in 2012. So the flow of traffic mirrors the political calendar. The Russians started much earlier than we thought they did, and they didn't stop when we caught them. The activity has grown. They gave us several kinds of data. Not only <coughs> did the, data, the, the level of engagement increase after the election, but it actually became multi-platform. So this is after 2016. Again, this is the swath of, um, swath of more recent data uh, since, uh, since the election itself. I'm going to draw your attention to two lines in particular. The first is the level of engagement with Facebook ads. I believe the industry, or Facebook in particular, uh, likes us to be focused on ads. Um, but overall, the ad purchases are a fairly small portion of the engagement mechanism. It's actually the organic content, or pseudo-organic content, that um, has most of the impact. I pick out Instagram because Instagram is the one as one of the platforms without an API, right? There's no easy way to get uh, data out of Instagram. This is, and I love my colleagues, but very few of us are on Instagram. None of us are on Snapchat, right? There's a, a range of platforms that we don't spend time studying. But we know uh, the kids are on Instagram, and this is where Russian political engagement is concentrated now. Topically, we're able to say a little bit about what the focus is for these accounts. <coughs> the first uh, broad swath of content was directed at the um, far right in the US, white supremacists, um, edging, people, uh, edging people to come out, encouraging people to come out in protest to the Black Lives Matter movement, sometimes even setting up through Facebook um, protests that would happen on the same street corner uh, right, uh, with Black Lives Matter and the Blue Lives Matter movement right, um, for police and service personnel, setting up protests at the same moment uh, on the streets in US towns. The second body of content related to, uh, sorry, focusing slowly, um, was re generally related to guns and abortion uh, issues, very important in the US. The third more recent body of content was directed at Latinos. I should say the, um, the content that tends to be race related is often about vote suppression. Um, it's either about asserting your political identity by not voting, boycotting the votes. Right? Um, if you're African American, no white politician is going to represent you well. The best thing you can do is stay at home on voting day. Uh, same thing with Latinos in the US context. Um, you'll never get satisfaction out of the political institutions that exist. Stay at home. Register your protest by not voting. So this is the mechanism um, for intervention in 2016. And I'm happy to say maybe a little more during Q&A about what, what I think um, the di dynamics are now. I want to use a little bit of our field work to, to look ahead to try to say something about how artificial intelligence is evolving in the current 
environment of the political consulting industry. I think there's a couple of credible scenarios for how AI will shape our lives, our political opportunities, and the political, our political opportunities. Um, the first, most obviously, from our Russian data, is that AI will be used to shape public opinion. Right? If someone can, if a political consultant can figure out how to take data from your devices to customize a message to create the face that you'll respond to well, uh, they will. They'll they'll sink resources into the science of doing that well. Um, and there's already enough research in political communication to know that uh, women respond well to a deep male voice. Uh, men respond well to a high-pitched female voice. There's, there's a number of generic things that we can say about um, the behavioral responses to political candidates. Coupled with enough information from your own social media feeds and your devices, this should provide a powerful toolkit for some, some consultants. I'll say a little bit in our examples about the kinds of uh, services that government agencies will provide. Uh, I think one of the most likely first applications for AI will be when uh, a minister of health decides in a significant way to use AI to allocate health resources across an entire country. Right? Or managing transport systems. These are, these are significant AI applications that, that will be political, that will involve some political decisions of some kind. I'm going to also speak a little bit about how these micro decisions or these domains of service provision are actually forms of governance in the sense that they are about providing governance goods. You're welcome to come have a seat up front. Sometimes when we think of the governance of a sovereign, we think of a, the full package of services that a state provides. Military security, collecting our taxes, guaranteeing our individual safety on the streets, paving the, paving the roads. right? Often governance goods are particular, they're, they're narrow, and I would say that there's a couple of industries in particular that, um, that will benefit most from AI. We've actually just, this um, number is now two days old. Um, two days ago we released our report, an inventory of government spending on political automation. To, uh, last year we found 48 countries with significant automation programs working to move public opinion. This year, we found 70. There are 70 countries around the world where governments or political parties are spending significant resources to push public opinion. Now, this is not, um, these are not lone programmers or teenagers doing uh, you know, occasional stories for the revenue. These are formal organizations with um, job ad postings and performance benefits and secretarial support and phones and desks and offices, rental agreements. These are formal organizations in the sociological sense. For authoritarian regimes, they tend to be military units that are retasked to doing automation and political life. In democracies, they're political parties um, who will sign up large contracts with a consulting firm to provide these services. So, uh, every regime type has these kinds of organizations. <coughs> the ratios are about the same. Um, a large number of the countries have people who provide online commentary, engage with citizens um, on uh, news sites. The vast majority of them maintain a body of fake accounts through which they communicate. A large number do automation. Um, in 31 of the 48 countries we studied last year, it was actually political parties doing this work. And in 10 of the countries, it was chat platforms, uh, WhatsApp almost entirely, um, that was being used in an automated way to push public opinion. Now, I want to offer four examples, um, oh, probably only one of, a, one of which would fit our uh, 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 democratic normative agenda for how to use AI in public life. Let me start here. This hairball, these hairballs, are, um, are a network graph of two types of books written about the Iraq War 15 years ago in the US. The books that have been coded liberal um, argue that we should not invade Iraq uh, was a big mistake, and uh, the president and his team lied to us. Uh, the books coded red were written by conservatives. And uh, at the time, the point of this research was to demonstrate that liberal authors don't cite conservative authors, and the conservative authors don't cite liberal authors, and that there's not very much in between. 
then the amount of scholarship in between these two greatly diminishes the um, ideological polarization. There are two, form, two firms looking to um, use sophisticated machine learning to extrapolate ideology from somebody's tweet stream. Their training data set for defining what a liberal is and what a conservative is is this 15-year-old data set about what liberalism meant uh, during the Iraq war and what conservatism meant during the Iraq war. This, this is the training data set for what a liberal and a conservative is. Now, regardless of what you think about whether the uh, um, Iraq war was legit, I guess two was um, uh, a, sensible, a sensible maneuver, most of us would probably agree that this should not be the training data for a modern conservative or a modern liberal. There are nuances that are here that would not be captured well. Moreover, um, this would be a specific US variant of what a conservative is and what a, what a liberal is. There would be other ways to help define what a liberal and conservative is. But this is, this is one of the most important training data sets now for the two firms that I've spent time with. This um, is IBM's uh, debating AI, right? Uh, so machine learning is being used to extrapolate what our ideological perspectives can look like. Uh, machine learning is also being turned to debating with humans. In this case, um, Noah Avadia, an Israeli debater, was set up to dis uh, debate with IBM's debating machine whether we should be putting more public resources into the space, pro space exploration. I don't recall who won on this particular case, but this is a very direct application. This is something that happened um, 18 months ago. It's a very direct application of creating a machine specifically to, to debate, right? Capture large volumes of content, answer this question of whether we humans should be spending more time on space research, and then engaging with the human on um, trying to convince them that something is true. This perhaps is the most famous of the examples, right? Um, using, um, using software to create junk videos, uh, fake videos, <laughs> Obama speaking, saying words that he uh, never said. We're sort of at a lucky moment in that the moment, we're at a lucky moment in that when someone tries to create a fake video and compresses the content for YouTube, Google is able to catch There's something in the compression that makes it easy to identify fake videos. That's. Um, a temporary advantage, right? Um, it's likely to be um, fleeting, and as the commercial grade software for altering video <laughs> improves, I suspect we'll see many more modes of doctored, automated doctoring of images. Now, the, the nice example, I spoke earlier about governance goods, right? There's the mode of government when an institution provides rules for uh, a wide range of um, social interactions. There are specific ways in which machine learning is already improving how we provide services collectively. Um, one of the old adages now for development economics is that you can use measures of light, light seen at night from space as a proxy for economic wealth. So when you want to model the, the when you want to model the spread of um, resources in a country getting those satellite images to figure out where the lights are on at night is supposed to reveal which towns, which cities are wealthiest. The correlation was always weak, right? Um, wealthy neighborhoods with large estates uh, don't generate a lot of light. Um, wealthy neighborhoods with big golf courses um, uh, don't generate a lot of light. And slums, the world's great slums, do occasionally generate light and don't get um, treated as um, poor zones. Revisiting the data captured from space on light um, allowed a particular pair of economists to figure out that it wasn't so much, it was their machine learning um, application that figured out it wasn't so much the generation of light, but the quality of roofing materials, which was revealed in the same kinds of data, but, but it was the quality of roofing materials that was actually the much better proxy for wealth, allowing them to vastly reorganize their models over what, um, uh, their econometric models over the distribution of poverty within, um, on, the, on the planet surface. So there are examples of AI being used in sophisticated ways to provide particular governance goods. I don't want to demean those opportunities. I do also, 
however, want to maintain, want to argue that the most serious challenges to public life are actually ahead of us, <coughs> not, not behind us. I think it's safe to say that um, every <coughs> national security crisis, every budget bill, every tax bill, every complex humanitarian disaster, every school shooting will come with some kind of automated political response for it or against it or um, blaming political Islam or uh, blaming immigrants uh, or attributing responsibility in ways that are just false. Uh, every major issue in every major country will have some kind of automation handling, trying to shape public opinion. M the original rate of our grant from the ERC was to study how the Russians and Chinese were manipulating public opinion in Western democracies. We definitely caught the Russians at it. Until recently, we hadn't seen the Chinese government at work. Um, they've burst into work uh, over the Hong Kong protests in the last two months. Uh, for the first time, we've seen significant multi-platform messaging in English uh, directed at global opinion. Um, we had caught the Chinese working on Taiwan, right, on the Taiwanese prime minister. Uh, we knew the Chinese government went after um, Falun Gong and Tibetans in exile. Those are reasonable. I mean, we can understand why those issues would be, uh, would be important to the Chinese government, but now global opinion is important to them in the same way that um, it's become important to the Russians. So being multi-platform, multilingual, um, has put China into this new category uh, that for a while only Russia occupied. In a sense, it's unfair to put the EU in this, in this same uh, cell, but I've sort of gone from worrying about what authoritarian regimes will do with automation to shape uh, you know, public opinion, to being concerned about the prospects for government over-regulation. It's very likely that the EU will regulate the application of uh, AI in political conversation in the next six to nine months. It's conceivable that, like GDPR, they'll come up with things that uh, don't just scale to Europe, right? They will scale whether or not we're in Europe. Whatever they come up will be applicable. Um, it will be impossible for Facebook's engineers or Google's engineers to respond in ways um, that the commission uh, that the commission um, sets as policy on AI application. So China is now active. There are other e there are other copycat regimes: uh, Turkey, Iran, Isra um, Turkey, Iran, Israel, Venezuela. There are a number of countries that have many IRAs now, right? Um, task at trying to maneuver public opinion. In fact, this year we also saw our first examples of cross-government uh, learning. Um, Myanmar went to Russia to learn some of these techniques. Um, Ethiopia, Ethiopia did some training uh, with Venezuela and Russia, so there's, there's, there's now learning across borders about how to use automation for political life. I think we've seen, most of the cases we've seen involve um, elections, right? Discrete moments, sort of convenient for us as researchers because we know they're coming. These are moments where we can take a scoop of data about political life. I think we're going to see these tricks start to be used for special issue, for special issues, right? When a lobbyist wants to seek relief from parliament, you know, here's a toolkit that they'll use. I don't believe, despite what um, Cambridge Analytica's rhetoric is, I don't believe we've actually seen AI applied um, to the development of particular messages, but I do think it's on the horizon. Many of the tricks that we know about are only, are barely legal in the US context and would certainly get you thrown in uh, jail in Europe and possibly here too. Um, but one example of this, um, how this might work, involves credit card data, which is um, you know, bartered fairly, uh, bought and sold fairly openly in the US. Um, if you're, um, whether you're female or not, if you've ever bought contraceptives on your credit cards, then some political actor wants that information. If you're a woman who's bought contraceptives on your credit cards, you're probably pro-life. Um, no, you're probably pro-choice, right? You're almost certainly not pro-life. Uh, so the pro pro-choice movement wants that data, and the pro-life movement wants the opposite data. If you have never actually bought contraceptives on your credit cards, you're probably pro-life, and uh, that political movement wants that data. If it's possible to marry data about your credit card purchases, the magazines, I'm sure nobody's ever bought a gun magazine, but in the US context, if you buy magazines about guns, the NRA wants that data, right? There's a number of any data from which we can make a political inference <coughs> 
from your credit card purchases is interesting to some lobbyist somewhere. And if that can be married with um, your health records and your tax records and your political registration files and your social media feed, firms will start to be able to use machine learning in sophisticated ways um, to tailor messages for you. Now, the deepest, most existential threat, and I'll stop in about three minutes, um, I think is a threat to science. Because at the moment, most of the messaging now, uh, coming from the Russians or uh, the Trump-related copycat accounts in the US, most of the messaging now is about undermining our public's interest in using evidence in political conversation. It's about encouraging uh, homeopathy or naturopathy over medical science. Um, it's about uh, getting us to elect politicians who go with their gut on key issues, um, not uh, particularly rely on evidence. Uh, it's about promoting issues that themselves we thought were um, put to bed. There's been a connection, a known causal link between smoking and cancer for 70 years. Right? It's, it's not up for debate. It's not, it's not an open question. Um, but here's a link, uh, something you should read. And it may depend on your gender, or it may depend on your brand. Right? It's, it's, uh, there's a few open questions left. Uh, some of the accounts we track have moved on to basic science issues. And I think one of the core problems we have, one of the core things we need to uh, wrap our heads around is the problem of providing AI with fresh data that actually does reflect our contemporary values, whether we're liberal or conservative, that um, preserves the diversity in society uh, in the data that's being used to train uh, from which we make inferences. And there are many different ways we can start to unpack what um, the values that we have in diversity. But the biggest mistakes, I think, that we seem to know about in AI, political applications of AI, come from lousy training data. That's, that's the common source for mistakes. I can go quickly to <coughs> how to fix that problem. The first idea, I think, in my fantasy world of redesigning the internet um, <laughs> involves um, a rip of I, an idea that I ripped from the Blood Diamonds campaign, and that involves reporting the ultimate beneficiary of the data that you've generated. I think we should be able to look at any device that we have on us and ask it to tell us which lobbyist or political group or political party or firm is making use of our data and maybe even what they're doing with that data. And devices can't do that right now. The, the, the information about where our data is going is, not, is never resident in the device. But we should be able to get a report of who's benefiting from our data. From there, I think it should be possible to add to the list of beneficiaries. Right? If Melita is taking my coffee consumption data and I want to support my favorite uh, organic coffee plantation in Haiti, I should be able to add them to the recipients of my flow of data. Um, in an ideal world, we might add uh, libraries or hospitals or social science researchers to the list of possible beneficiaries. I also think infrastructure could tithe in a way that it currently doesn't, right? Uh, large volumes of data don't end up in our hands to play with. It's taken um, judiciary committees, a Senate intelligence committee, four years of bad press, uh, multiple governments beating up on Facebook to get 3,000 accounts of examples of, of what's going on. Um, infrastructure that tithes is one way to build the public life that we need. One of the few rules that seems to work in data management is this nonprofit rule around particular variables. So um, you can't profit by selling voter registration files. You can, when you marry it with credit card data or contraceptive use or anything else, a data mining firm can profit by that merging, merging process. They're not supposed to profit from the voter registration file itself. And I would argue that we could probably extend the list of variables right, to cover a range of public health variables that firms should not be able to profit from. Perhaps I'll save for Q&A the prospects for al algorithmic audits, because I know that certainly inspires uh, debate. 
I'm not sure that I've been able to restore faith um, as the way uh, I promised in democracy. Um, I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. I think we're at um, a special moment in public life when uh, research is particularly important, and that's sort of an enable gazing thing for me to say. But um, at this moment, our team is operating on faith, really, that the things we're doing will be valued or valuable, that it's worth exposing these political problems before they get worse. I do think we've got uh, four or five years before AI rolls out in a political, politically sophisticated way. But at some point, the political parties will make investments. Uh, it's conceivable you'll have an election in the next month or two or three or four. I don't think AI will be pushing public opinion in January or February. But four or five years after that, um, I do think AI will have a role in determining what content you see, when, and it's conceivable that you'll be engaging with AI and not fully understand the terms of the agreement. So thanks for your time. I'm happy to take questions. I could listen to that forever. And, uh, uh, I find it mind-boggling to know how we're going to deal with this in society. This mm -hmm. thing we've unleashed, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. But uh, now we have a very interesting <coughs> audience here, so please, who's been asking for questions. Do you want to uh, tell, um, it'd be, I think it'd be good if you said, please tell us who you are and what your discipline is. Yeah. You? <laughs> Thank you, let's start at the front. And um, would you honor me as a speaker? We'll go boy, girl, boy, girl. <laughs> well, you can, do, you can handle it. I'm happy okay. to let you handle okay. it. Oh. Hi, uh, my, my name is Kevin, uh, so I won't be shouting though, uh, uh, and hopefully it's not the wrong answer to the question. I'm a mechanical engineer, so I don't know what business I have, but it does I'm affect me. Here. Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, uh, in 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 the ways that you enumerated of possibly mitigating the problem. Um, is another way an al alternative model for internet itself? Because all of this is premised on an ad-based model of the internet mm -hmm. uh, for which data collection is required and all of those things. So it, I, I've heard people pushing for a subscriber model for the internet. You know, there are a couple of websites that do that, but predominantly we've just agreed that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, uh, what do we do? Are there steps that we can take as individuals in individual action as opposed to policy levels that, that we can do. So I've heard people saying, you know, I don't turn off cookies, I scramble them. So mm. so you can basically, you know, produce an image of whatever you want to present yourself as. So those are the two okay. broad questions I have. Um, I am skeptical that we can ever take back social media or undo Facebook or, or recreate an entire platform. So I think the best, most plausible route forward for us in public policy is to create the options to donate data, right? If our, if our data is a moment of civic expression, at the moment, we're expressing ourselves to firms in Silicon Valley. The best data on public life is not in the libraries. Um, it's in uh, on public policy. In the city. So I don't think we can undo things I haven't seen scalable models for what an ad-free internet would look like, and nobody's figured out the micropayments system in a credible way. Um, that is also the basis of my, I guess, my response to your good question about what should we, we should do as individuals. It sounds banal, but checking your credit card records for mistakes, um, it, making sure you know general data hygiene, flushing your cookies every once in a while, and um, requesting data when you can, and teaching your friends about why this is important. Um, those are the, the modes of activism I'd encourage us to pursue. Um, I don't think, you know, most people most of the time don't talk about politics on Instagram. Yeah, it's only in the two or three days before people vote. And that's, that's when it's important. So we're not going to get the public interested in this issue significantly. Um, a little bit of personal activism and creating this option, this, this new culture of sharing data, I think those would be the routes forward. Yeah. Who's, that? Who's next? Okay, two, and then we'll turn to the ladies. Yeah. So my name is Hector Talbot. I am based at um, the 
economics department mm. in the Faculty of Social Sciences. And I wanted to know, given your talk, uh, what would be your reaction to the recent announcement by Facebook uh, towards encryption? Mm. Um, in the encrypted chat? Yes, to, to encrypt everything on Facebook. Wouldn't that be a solution? Or is that against completely all the policies that you have recommended? Or would it be against the beneficiary policy? So I knew that they were moving to an encrypted chat, um, trying to emulate what they've purchased, right, in WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah. And I didn't know that they were going to try to roll that off over the entire platform. What I would say is that um, Facebook is much closer to public infrastructure now for, 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 um, for us than the firm itself appreciates. And so I like the part of the policy that would involve increasing security uh, between uh, users. Um, but I'm not sympathetic to arguments about how Facebook needs to do things to protect its community values. Those, I find, are generally uh, punts to avoid the issue of uh, responsibility for publishing, large Im for distributing large amounts of misinformation to voters in the three days before they vote. Right. Uh, our political scientists tell us that most people don't make up their mind until the last few days. And there's many, many big picture causes of this problem. Uh, higher ed isn't teaching people the critical thinking skills we should be. Uh, journalism needs a new profit model. Right? But it's also that Facebook serves misinformation to voters in the three days before they vote. That's, that's the proximate cause of some of these problems. I'm not sure that the encryption, platform-wide encryption, will help with that. So but would, wouldn't that affect the, uh, the possibility of bots accessing other accounts, beyond mm. those that they are already, or being able to distribute fake news? Fake news. You know, one of the, one of the odd things we found in Brazil was an overlay that um, a party developed that would let a citizen dedicate their entire, uh, provide access to their entire Facebook account overnight um, to the campaign, and then the campaign manager would use that to uh, send out messages, uh, do some activism. Th that's a, a mode of automation that wouldn't be solved by the encryption if, if uh, you know, there's uh, keys are provided or if there's some kind of overlay before the encryption ro rolls out, knowing nothing about how Facebook is going to implement this. Um, I would say that, that the um, the spirit of innovation amongst campaign managers is such that they'll look for, they'll look for some tricks. Yeah. Um, I'd also point out that much of the activity is on Instagram, so I would be curious to know if they're, if they're doing this for Instagram as well. Please, yes, thank you. Two and three. Hi, um, so Grace Burton, I'm in the engineering faculty, but also a law student. Um, you talked about strategies, and yeah. I'd be interested to know who you think needs to be leading those. They sound like they need to be international, whether they, there are sort of various levels that they need to be implemented at? Good question. Strategies. And so um, I am not sure. There are very few co countries with um, federal agencies that would address any of this. I can't think of which one in the US would um, have the energy or time or resources to do this. DCMS is doing some creative thinking around with a particular frame of internet harms. But I think it's, it will actually be the European Commission that will make decisions with some reasonable policy um, you know, conversation with experts. We don't always like what the Commission does, but they, seem, they do have a structure for engaging with expertise and coming up with solutions and rolling them out and enforcing them. They have a structure that seems to work better than anything in the UN system, anything in the multi-stakeholder system, uh, and anything in any federal government. Although, I would also defer to you in the law department if, if you think I'm wrong. No? OK. Thank you. Please. Um, and then... Uh, Wendy White from the library. Um, and it's sort of follow-up related question to that, really. I'm interested in you talk about data as a civic expression and the potential role of libraries. Um, just like strategy, do you feel this, like there are new players and new stakeholders that can get involved here in new ways, new alliances mm -hmm. that could maybe work in the... Um, governance arena, I mean, you mentioned the EU, that could maybe make a difference? Yes, uh, certainly, and uh, libraries are key to this. I think I would, I would rather see libraries be restored as repository of public knowledge, thank you, um, than um, 
maintain the private holding of this incredible wealth of data uh, in, in Silicon Valley. I think my, in my fantasy world, if a researcher has uh, gone through a university ethics process, um, been offered large sums of money from a public science agency, and uh, has a decent reputation as a scholar, they've already gone through more ethics oversight and budget management you know, oversight rules in a public university than any Facebook researcher has ever had. And in an ideal world, if we apply to funding from UKRI, or we apply for funding with, uh, from the ERC, that is the credibility by which we should have access to Facebook data. The, the ethical oversight of what we do here is, is rigorous, <laughs> right? It's not perfect, yeah, it's not perfect. It's, it's better than what the firms do. So I would say, um, this is also an answer to the question of what institutions might fix this. Um, a stronger partnership between public science agencies and libraries could create that, that opportunity to, to provide access to data for us. Please. Um, the, uh, uh, Wendy, Wendy said that we couldn't put the uh, genie back in, oh sorry, Dennis Deckel and I teach cyber security here. Um, Wendy said that we couldn't put the genie back in the bottle, but mm. the Chinese government is still investing a great deal of resource into trying to control internet discourse in pretty much every domain it has access to within, within China. Mm. Um, do you think they're doomed to fail, or do you think their tactic might spread? I don't think they're doomed to fail. I think. Um, you know, it's possible to imagine three different cultures of AI. Um, uh, one that's uh, Chinese built and maintained by Chinese values, um, where the technology is for social control and surveillance and uh, protecting cultural values. And one can imagine the US culture producing AIs that are um, ripping from old data sets that are thoroughly unregulated, um, develop, you know, exciting new, exciting new applications and domains of life that we actually don't, you know, wouldn't want. And for the moment, let, give me, lend me the notion that the UK and Europe have some shared values on data protection. And one could imagine a European culture of AI that evolves around, um, around um, meeting public expectations for what machine learning can be allowed to do here, um, not being Wild West like in the US, but also not being authoritarian like in China. Um, so I don't think, so I, I don't, I would agree that we can't put the, China, the, the genie back in the bottle. Um, it's possible that the Chinese will open up their social media platforms in some surprising way, but there's no particular evidence that that's, that is nigh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Dave Millard, I'm a computer scientist. I work with Wendy in the web science group. Um, it, it seems to me that one way you could conceptualize this problem is as the asymmetric application mm. of technology. Um, so a lot of the things you've been talking about in terms of regulatory frameworks or uh, educational frameworks are about reducing the effectiveness of this type of technology to change people's opinion and, and to make us more robust to it as a public. Mm. Um, the other part of that would be to employ the technology on the other side. Mm. So, you know, if we don't like the proliferation of anti-vaxxer messages online, then we should have organizations which are proliferating, uh, are proliferating um, pro-vaccination messages online. Do you, do you agree with that analysis? And what do you see as, a, a, as problematic about, if anything, about that as a solution? Okay. I will um, try to answer, and then I'll, I'll reshape your question to the question that I want. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we'll go here, and then up, uh, up the road. The, um, it's conceivable. So I've been imagining uh, the, politi the political application of machine learning will be by large parties or entire government bureaucracies. It's conceivable that um, small private AIs will help defend us, right? work for us, and take on our values, or that we would help guide them, to represent us well, um, to defend us against the spam and the dumb chatbots and the, you know, the clear misinformation. Um, it's possible to imagine AIs that will actually be working for us as individual citizens. And I wonder, um, the first part of your question. So it was about, the, about this, is a, this is about the technology being employed an asymmetric way. Right. So could we, if we employ it the other way, mm -hmm. does, that, does that help solve the problem or does that just make it worse? And it's a there are 
So there are some interesting applications, right? Um, news, news organizations that are using AI to do computational journalism, right? To, to break new stories in large data sets for patterns that they can't, ana um, you know, can't analyze qualitatively by reading all the, reading all the data, reading all the um, evidence. I think um, there have been, um, of, of the, the organizations that I know are considering this, um, Ukrainian civil society groups are the closest to practically evaluating this and deciding maybe to use machine learning to defend themselves. Right? So Ukraine is the, is the testing bed for a significant amount of Russian, um, Russian computational propaganda. And they are, um, it's been 10 plus years now of cyber attacks and, and uh, misinformation campaigns. The, several of the Ukrainian civil society groups I know are, are considering using their own bots to respond. I'm not sure I have an answer on whether that's good or not. Um, I, I mean, it will degrade public life. It's hard to imagine being, uh, going through 10 years of, of onslaught from uh, Russian propaganda. Um, so I, I guess I would say I'm sympathetic. It would be wonderful if all political actors just stopped doing it. Um, but I would guess maybe I'd say that in, in extreme settings, it might be worth using it as defense. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture, which I really enjoyed. I'm Pauline Leonard. I'm a sociologist, and I'm also uh, a director in the WSI. Um, I was thinking as you were talking that there was quite a few similarities with the early days of television where people were very frightened about the messages that were coming out of television and very worried that we would all like kind of passive dupes just uh, imbibe all these messages and be totally influenced by them. And audience research has shown that actually we're very skilled as viewers or as receptors of uh, any kind of information uh, and that we're getting obviously more and more skilled all the time. Uh, and it, uh, an individual can actually be highly skilled uh, going forward in creating AI to resist and play with all these sorts of messages. So I suppose my question is about uh, the role of the uh, receiver, the role of, of audiences in this. Um, how much actually we have to kind of worry about this or, or how skilled people will be, be increasingly becoming in dealing with all these, um, you know, sort of rogue messages and... Uh, 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 myths and stories that are, are sort of drowning, drowning us all. Right. So I think there's an important methodology point in your question, and that is that um, it's very difficult. I, I cannot model the impact of a tweet on a voter. Right. I can't. There, there are no models for um, volume of misinformation and changed behavior um, yet uh, in public. Right. Um, Facebook probably has those models, but we don't. So uh, I would say that we are probably getting better at um, catching misinformation. We are probably, on the whole, getting more suspicious of content. I believe that the levels of trust in media institutions are dropping, um, and social media firms in particular are dropping, but they're still much higher than trust in other, other, um, other kinds of organizations. And then. I think the, what makes this stuff powerful or particularly nasty is that it is distributed over networks rather than through class. Uh, and so the issue isn't so much, you know, Zuckerberg said at one point that uh, only 1% of the political content on um, Facebook was misinformation. The issue isn't so much that there's 1% uh, of the content evenly distributed across the country. It's, it's that it gets concentrated in these network effects um, directed at particular populations who won't have the information literacy um, or who are um, fulfilling some of the cognitive selective exposure effects that we, um, uh, elective affinity effects that we know people have when we, when we, when we process large amounts of political information. So um, in any given election that's close, right, uh, where it's 51-49 and a percentage point makes a difference in an outcome, the misinf misinformation can still play a role in that causal story for the whatever outcome we've expected. Yeah. I think we're getting better. Um, I think public understanding of the problem is on the rise. I'm not sure it's sufficient <coughs> yet. 
Hey. Hi, um, my name is Chris Cho. I am a machine learning researcher with a background in economics. So economics? my question, sorry? In uh, economics? Yes, that's right. So my question is, historically there have always been um, interventions from multiple different parties involved in elections, um, whether it be by street campaigns or advertisement boards, etc. Now, um, now this is on a bigger scale in the social media now, and it's using private data to be more targeted. But isn't it the right of the voter to be swayed, uh, perhaps even in the incorrect direction, and be responsible for their decisions in a democracy? What is it our, why is it our duty to then uh, intervene directly, as opposed to the previous question um, by that gentleman over there, um, actively combat it in the, in the other direction? Is it our responsibility, or is it something that is a natural part of society? I think it's our responsibility to provide reasonable quality information to people whose opinions we, we want to collect um, at uh, the right times before they vote. Yeah, maybe we'll take one more. Huh? Yeah, I was going to say, we need to start winding this up. So yeah. One more. We've had several boys, so we can go to a girl. OK, thank you. Um, I do think we have an obligation to maintain a lo the, the lower threshold of quality information. You know, if such a significant amount of information, um, if, if there's too much misinformation in public sphere on election day, voters aren't um, only responsible for the quality of news and information. They um, will effectively make mistakes. So if you look at the concentration of junk news around the United States, there were particular states that got most of the news that was, uh, was misinformation. Um, those aren't informed voters. And for democracy to work, um, you want to at least try to provide voters with some quality information. Now, the countries that seem to be sort of inoculated against these effects are the ones that have public broadcasters. And I don't mean that they're countries where the, the government owns the media. I mean there's some kind of independent public media system that creates a culture of professional journalism. And then those professional journalists go off and work in private media. But they have the norms and values for what truth is and accuracy is. And, and they do fact checking on their stories. Uh, I think it's reasonable to set some public expectations for what professional journalism looks like and expect everybody to know some basic facts on an issue before they vote. Please. Why not get rid of democracy and then the problem of manipulating the elector electorate goes away? Right. Socrates, 400 BC, said this would happen. So the question is good in that... Who you were, Eric? Ah, uh, uh, I'm Eric, I'm a retired old fool. Um, so the question is good in that there are some alternatives. I'm not sure we would like all the alternatives, uh, and they're not all clearly compelling. And I would say that um, the kind of authoritarianism that sometimes we refer, refer to as gentle authoritarianism or network authoritarianism, right? Um, Singapore or you know, perhaps Hong Kong until recently, um, those aren't clearly good examples of fully functioning states. So. Uh, the number of democracies that are small, where people seem to have a high quality of life uh, and enjoy participating in politics, uh, those are the countries that many people around the world aspire to move to. This is totally a pub conversation, right? <laughs> and I don't have an easy answer to that, except that I'd rather do some of these slight rule changes to the election system and stick with democracy. Right, so. <laughs> Uh, 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 that's been fascinating. I know, uh, we must stop now because people have to go and do the things they have to do in uh, the, the real, real life. Um, I could sit and listen to Phil answer your questions forever. Uh, it's so interesting. I think Eric, by the way, is uh, one of our greatest computer scientists in terms of uh, uh, how he taught our students. And he's from Malaysia. And I learned a very interesting lesson about democracy at that dinner I had with you in Malaysia. Do you remember that one? <laughs> But I met the opposition party. Hmm. Um, <laughs> we're now in power. Very, very interesting story. But I was just going to... Um, um, such insightful uh, comments from, from uh, Phil. And I was just thinking something you said. It made me look up how many elections we've had in the UK 
since Facebook started. Facebook didn't start. It's, it, it began in at Harvard, of course. Uh, I'm sure most of you all know that Mark Zuckerberg designed Facebook to rate girls, right? And it still has that ethos in the company. Um, <laughs> Uh, at Harvard, I remember Southampton students, but by then it was uh, a much more general type of uh, platform, using it very quickly. Um, and that was only in 2004, so it's only existed 15 years. And the, uh, we have had a, only a handful of elections, um, five, according to this. One was uh, the Tony Blair one in 2005, which Facebook wouldn't have affected at all. Um, and then we had, uh, we have five, Four other, three other elections plus a referendum in the time since Facebook has been growing. And the scary thing for me is the rate at which this problem is hitting us. Um, and that like the technology keeps on moving and, and people start learning how to use it for good or bad in between the elections. Of course, the, the, in the US, I remember giving lectures about when Obama won in 2008 and 2012 because of his use of social media in a very overt way. And, it, and he was credited as being one of the people that you know, helped grow Facebook because of his use of social media. And I just think it's so, and then you go back right to the beginning of your talk about, um, I'm working up a new talk on the called The Future is Fake, because I think this is so scary uh, that, that, that we just won't know what to trust and what not to trust when the bots especially are producing it. Uh, so you have painted a fascinating world that I think the one thing that I want to say at the end here is the most important thing to me, and I know it's the thing I'm most passionate about, is the only way to tackle this from a research point of view is from an interdisciplinary approach. None of this would you have done just from political science. And that, you know, you run the OII, I run the WSI, we have a wonderful interdisciplinary audience here, and I think that to me is the answer from an academic point of view, is the future has to be interdisciplinary. And on that note, Phil, I'd like to thank you so much for coming down. We get to talk to you over dinner, lots more questions over dinner, but thank you for giving us the lecture this afternoon.